Happy Easter. Recording in progress. That song gets me every time, but particularly this year, um, as we just had our, our third baby and the rest of my family's at home. Um, we live in uncertain times, but we have a certainty, right? We know that our Redeemer lives and on the earth again we'll stand and our bodies might face death, but we have a hope. Jesus said, I am he that liveth, that liveth and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. And because he lives, we live also. Amen. I wanted to sing a song uh, before we start. I'm probably crazy because I'm going to cry. But um, when you have kids, old songs come back to you. Songs that maybe your mom sang when you were a kid. Maybe you heard on Easter Sundays years ago. This hymn is not in our hymn books, uh, but it's one that, that I've always loved. And I love the words on each of the verses. And typically when you do special music, you cut verses because it's too long. Uh, but I wanna sing these verses because I want you to hear the words. The song is called, I am he that liveth. And it's old, old, old song. I don't even know when it was written. But the words to me, ring very true. It goes through the story of our salvation and reminds us of what it means for us today. And I think it's a great way to launch in to the message the Lord has uh, shared, uh, has had me to share today. And um, so I'll sing it. Please pay attention to the words and hopefully I'll get through it. <laughs>
am he that liveth, that liveth and was dead. I am he that liveth, that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Behold, I am alive forevermore. I am he that liveth, that liveth and was dead. Father, we, we are so grateful that Jesus is alive forevermore. He holds the keys of hell and of death. The grave has no hold on us. As we share this message, we also want to remember that this was not something that happened by accident, that this was not something that happened on a whim, but before the foundation of the world, God had planned to redeem his people, through the blood of your son and through his resurrection. Oh Lord, we ask this morning that by your grace, we would have the strength to understand what you want to teach us today. Lord, show us from your word the things that you want us to know. You have shown us and told us these things for many years. This is not a new thing. Through ages in the past, you put prophecies together. You had feasts, you had traditions that you gave your people that would point to the Lord Jesus coming, dying, rising again, and reigning forevermore. Lord, help us to understand and to receive what we have to hear today. Lord, help me to share it clearly. Give me your strength, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have been going through the book of Acts. It's a great series. And uh, we took a, we're taking a break from our regular uh, passages to, to talk about Easter, to talk about the Lord Jesus' resurrection. But we can't divorce Acts from the resurrection because the book of Acts begins only 40 days after Jesus has risen again. And Acts chapter 2, which is the launch of the church, began only 50 days after the resurrection and only 10 days after Jesus had ascended into heaven. Think about that. What were you doing 10 days ago? I don't remember because I haven't slept in 10 days, but uh, most of you would remember, look at your calendar. What were you doing 10 days ago? Think of how, how recent that was. And think about this early church in the book of Acts and how powerful Jesus' resurrection, how impacting his resurrection was to them and how that filled everything they talked about, how that surrounded everything they did and impacted all of their actions, their thoughts, and their words. Imagine these Jewish people, 500 plus that saw Jesus rise again into heaven. They are now filled with God's spirit in trying to convince their brothers and sisters, the other Jewish people around them, that Jesus is their Messiah. What do you think they said to them? In our postmodern world, we would say, well, they told their testimony. They would say, we saw him with our own eyes, that, that I saw him, I experienced the resurrection. I saw him, the nails in his hands, I touched them. I touched his side and I saw him rise up into heaven. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And that's a valid thing and I'm sure they shared that. But we also have to remember that there's another set of holidays and feasts going on as we celebrate Easter. We as Christians don't think about them quite as much, but to an early Christian, an early Jewish convert, they meant the world. In fact, they were the center of their world. There were seven Jewish feasts 
that were required by the law of Moses in the book of Leviticus chapter 23. And four of them happened in the first 50 days of Jesus' resurrection and his death and resurrection. Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, and then Pentecost, which is Acts chapter 2. Four of the seven most important holy days of the Jewish nation happened. Passover, the day that Jesus died, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the day he was in the tomb it began, and the Feast of First Fruits, the exact day that Jesus rose again from the dead. And then the Feast of Pentecost, 50 days later, on the exact day the Holy Spirit was given to the church. Coincidence? I think not. I think not. You see, I think if we don't understand the significance of these Jewish feasts, it's hard for us to understand the painstaking details that God went through to make sure people would know who the Messiah was. And so when that early church in Acts chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and 13 and beyond would share with them the gospel message that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus can save you from your sins, that Jesus Christ is Lord, I think they had another message to share along with their own personal testimony. Because all of these people knew the feast and they knew all the details. They had to, it's required. They had no choice. Every Passover, they started the whole process and they went straight on through. And it was a week of straight up, let's be Jewish. And then they had 40, 50 days. And then they had another time to have to be very Jewish and had to come to Jerusalem, actually. And so I want to share with you, I want to turn this into a little synagogue for a minute, a little Jewish synagogue and talk through these feasts to help us appreciate what God has done because he didn't do this on a whim. This is not something that was created five minutes ago. You know, in our culture, we have Pop-Tarts, right? We've got TV dinners. We have TikTok. We've got those little Instagram stories that appear for 24 hours and they go away and people go live and it goes away. And all of these things are disposable and instantaneous. And we think about them in a minute and we do something. We're very impulsive people, right? Well, God is not impulsive. God is not reckless. God is not disposable. And he doesn't hold things in a disposable way. He's eternal. And when he makes a plan, he doesn't just throw it out there for you to figure out. He's given you Easter eggs, if you want to call it, all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout time, really. You even go to oral history of many different cultures and you find these Easter eggs. You find glimpses and shadows and prophecies of the resurrection. It's very important that we appreciate these things because God is not a God of the temporary. He's a God of the eternal. I am he that liveth and liveth and was dead and behold, I am alive for 24 hours forevermore. I'm alive forevermore. And just as eternity passed, we can't even measure what that looks like. We don't know what eternity future is going to hold, but he's given us Easter eggs for that too. And tonight, today, we might have time to talk about those. We want to talk about those Easter eggs, those prophecies, those feasts that God put in place so that you and I can appreciate in a deeper way the, re the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then hopefully also appreciate the church that he has set up to be his standard of truth in this age and what they call the summer harvest of souls. And also to appreciate that there are three more feasts that are coming in the fall. Three feasts, and they don't relate to anything that's happened in the past. They're all relation to something in the future, the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you can appreciate the first, you can surely bet that in the future, when these three other feasts happen and they are fulfilled, they will be fulfilled to the T. And we will look at them and say, oh yeah, Jesus came back. Hasn't happened yet, so there's still a bit of mystery shrouding it, but it's coming. And as sure as Jesus rose again, he's coming again. 
think I gave a full sermon in the introduction, but let's get into this. I want to read this uh, passage in Luke chapter 24. You're welcome to turn there if you'd like, but this is as Jesus is walking, the risen Christ Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus with two disciples who decided to defect, to leave the disciples gathered together in the upper room and go home. Jesus died and they'd given up. But on the road to Emmaus, Jesus met them, shrouded so they could not know who he was. He began talking with them. And they started telling how Jesus died and they thought he was the Messiah and he died. So I guess he's not. We've been mistaken. We're fools. And then Jesus says to them, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? In beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall or on the shoulder of someone in that conversation. But I bet you one of the places he started was the seven Levitical feasts of the Jews. So here's the feast. Let's just lay it out for you. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, and then there's the summer harvest break. We understand that as the church age, which we live in now. And then there's three more trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. Those little pictures might give you a glimpse into what uh, they are symbolizing and what they prophesy. If you have uh, the ability, turn with me to Leviticus 23. We're going to start with the Feast of Passover. And then this passage says, these are the feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed time. So God's saying, these are your feasts. These are your holidays. You need to do these things. And the first one is on the 14th day of the month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. You'll remember Thursday they prepared for the Passover. Jesus had the last supper. He went to the garden. He was arrested. And on Friday, the day they would kill the Passover lamb, they killed the Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the Passover points to four specific things, maybe more, of the Lord Jesus. It points to the Messiah, who is our Passover lamb. The feast of the Passover was looking back to when they were slaves in Egypt. If you watch the movie, 10 commandments, you'll get a little glimpse of what that is. If not, it's on this weekend. So check it out. Uh, but the whole point is if the children of Israel did not put blood on their doorposts and the side posts of their house, their firstborn child died. And those that put the blood, when the angel of death passed, saw them, he passed over them. And they had to kill an innocent lamb to get that blood so that their children would be saved. And that's the same thing for us. We were all under condemnation of death. The angel of death was coming for us and deservedly so. We weren't innocent like most children. We're the firstborn sinners of whom I am chief. And Jesus was our Passover lamb. He was killed for us. His blood was on the wood for us and shed for us. Jesus is our Passover lamb. His blood was shed for us. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. And the question is, have you applied the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to the doorpost of your heart? Have you allowed his blood to cover your sins? Jesus was also, of course, crucified during that time of Passover or when it was observed, you can check that out in Mark 14. Uh, it says uh, there uh, that he was, he was killed at that point. And so uh, we've got this, this perfect time. Again, not a coincidence that Jesus died on the Passover. Jesus was that lamb without blemish, that lamb without spot or defect. He was perfect in all of his ways. No sin, no problems, nothing in him that would cause a sin to blemish the sacrifice. He was the only one that was that way. You and I, full of sin. You and I, we have nothing worthy of taking the place of someone else on a cross. Only Jesus lived that perfect life. And as the first Passover marked the Hebrews' release from Egyptian slavery, praise God, so the death of Christ 
marks our release from the slavery to sin. Isn't that amazing? Think about that. The pictures line up so perfectly. They were slaves in, in Egypt, forced labor. They couldn't do anything but do what they were told. And don't you feel that way sometimes about your sin nature? There's literally nothing you can do, right? You, you just can't help but sin. You can't help but make mistakes. You can't help but do wrong things. You're slave to it. It's like it's a master driving you to do evil. Okay, maybe you don't kill anybody, but you sure wish to sometimes when you're driving on the highway. And this wickedness in your heart, you just can't help it. Jesus' death releases you from the slave master of sin. He releases you from that law of sin and of death. That's what it says in Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and of death. Praise God. I'm free because Jesus died. That's Passover. That's the feast of Passover. You see how closely aligned Jesus' death was to this feast. It's amazing. Leviticus 23, 6, the second feast. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. In seven days, you must eat unleavened bread. Everyone's seen matzah crackers, I'm assuming. They taste not so great, but uh, they're important because they have no leaven in them. In the Bible, leaven is always a symbol of sin. Symbol of sin. And this feast, the seven, seven's another thing that always points to perfection. So leaven's a picture of sin. Seven is the number of perfection. And so they ate unleavened bread for seven days, starting on the Saturday, that Sabbath after Passover started. And, you know, this points to the Messiah's sinless life. Levin, the picture of sin, but he is making the perfect sacrifice for our sins. First Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you might be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see that picture there? Jesus was our Passover, and it goes right into that feast of unleavened bread. And the whole point is we don't need that leaven anymore. We have a new life, an unleavened life, a life free from sin. And Jesus is that perfect one who makes it possible. Jesus' body was in the grave during the first days of that feast. And I love that part because, you know, we, we often overlook Jesus in the grave. God dead in the grave. It's just something, you can't quite understand it. But like a kernel of wheat planted and waiting to burst forth as the bread of life, so is Jesus. John 12, 23 to 24 Jesus says this himself. Jesus answered and said to them, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Think about it. You got to put a seed into the ground in order to get a crop, right? Now, I'm no farmer. My dad's maybe a farmer. He grew up as a history of farm, but I didn't, we lived in the city. But this concept of seeds is very interesting. The seed has to go into the dirt, into the ground, just like you bury a person into the dirt. And it has to literally die. That's what the term is called in real technical terms. It has to die. And then it springs to new life. They don't know how it happens. It's a miracle of God, a miracle of life, just like human life in some way. And then it can produce thousands and thousands of grains of wheat kernels of wheat from one little seed dying in the ground. And that's the Lord Jesus. One little kernel, one person, one perfect life dying brings forth billions of souls to God. You and me, if we believe in the Lord Jesus, we live, we have life, eternal life, 
because he died and now he produces life. You see how even harvest, grain, the creation of crops, picture the Lord Jesus Christ. This feast pictures the Lord Jesus Christ's death and how it brings forth so much life. Leviticus 23, 10 to 11, third feast. This is the feast of first fruit. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Okay, Friday, Passover. Saturday, Sabbath, Feast of Unleavened Bread. What's the day after the Sabbath, anybody? You can say it. Sunday. Sunday. Oh, we know what day it is today. Very good. Right. Sunday. So just think about that. It's the only feast of the Lord that's on a Sunday. Feast of first fruits. Wouldn't that be also the day that Jesus rose again from the dead? The first fruits. This pointed to the Messiah's resurrection for sure. That he was the first fruits of the righteous that would follow. Remember that one grain of wheat falling into the ground? Well, there's always a first crop that springs up, right? That first little head that comes up. We have lilies planted in our yard. I forgot I planted them last year. All of a sudden, I saw this little green sprout popping up. And I also forgot I planted um, a tulip. And I saw this little tulip pop out of the ground. That first fruit is special. The first flower of spring, those little purple flowers, Mary would know the name, I don't. Uh, they pop up in your grass. And it's this beautiful reminder that spring is coming. That first fruit that comes onto your tree, that first tomato in your garden, the first apple you pluck from the tree, that first fruit is special. And God said, it's special to me too. And you need to offer it to me. That's the feast of first fruits. You bring the first thing you harvest from your crops and you give it to God. And, and the, the priest would wave it before the Lord. It was the first fruit and it was for God. And that was definitely a picture of the Messiah's resurrection. It's one of the first reasons why the Apostle Paul refers to Jesus Christ as the first fruits from the dead in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 to 22, this great passage when he's going through the gospel. And he says this, this right here, let me read it to you. But now Christ is risen from the dead and he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam, all die, but even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. That first fruit, oh, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they took that fruit off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and it brought great death, destruction, and devastation to humanity. We still feel its effects every day. And in Adam, we're all sons of Adam through a very long family tree. We all die. It's a real, that's a, definitely a mark of who you belong to, what creature you belong to. We are all sons of Adam because we all die. But in Christ, we will all be made alive. See, he was a new fruit, the first fruit of something else, something new that God was doing. I am he that liveth and was dead. I am the resurrection and the life, he would say. He who believes in me will never die, but will live. There's no more eternal death for those of us who trust in the Lord Jesus. Yes, our physical bodies are still sold under sin. We're, our bodies are still part of this whole generation of Abraham, but our soul is now free. We can have eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's an amazing truth. Jesus rose from the dead on that Sunday, the day after the Sabbath, as it states here. And Jesus was the first to raise in the power of endless life, but he's not going to be the last. And that is the true story of first fruits. It was the first of a massive harvest to come. And that massive harvest was then celebrated on the Feast of Pentecost, the culmination of those 50 days of harvest of the barley, the wheat, and the grain. But you know what? There's something in between these feasts. It's not a feast, but it's really important. 
Because Jesus isn't sitting in the front row physically at our chapel this morning. He's not enthroned in the palace in Jerusalem or in the temple. He's in heaven. And something we were talking about in our small groups a couple weeks ago is why did Jesus have to ascend into heaven? I don't have all the answers, but I want to talk about the ascension for a little bit. Oh, that was the verse I just read. Um, and these are more verses about him living and us living. But the ascension, you know, it signaled the end of his earthly ministry. The Lord Jesus came. And he wasn't meant to stay here on this earth forever. He was God. He took on the form of humanity. He had to step down and squeeze his deity into this sinful flesh. Of course, he had no sin, but it was still a real hardship for God to be trapped in this body. And yet, when he went back into heaven, it signaled that's the end of his earthly ministry. It signified that he was successful in his earthly ministry, that he had come all that come and done all that he had to do. There was nothing left for him to do. And it marked the return of his heavenly glory, that glory that was only seen one time on earth at the transfiguration, that glory that he's had for all of eternity. Remember, he says, now is time for the son of man to be glorified. There was a glory that he deserved. It symbolized and really made possible the exaltation to the father that is also prophesied of the Messiah. It allowed him to prepare a place for us too. Because remember, he's the first fruit of many to come. And so if we have any hope of going to heaven, he better go there first. Does that make sense? If, if the future for us is in the presence of God, he had to go there first. He had to be the one that led the way to glory. And it indicated the beginning of a new work for him as the high priest. It's very important, especially if you read the book of Hebrews, how key Jesus' role today as the high priest is. We no longer need the earthly temple, the earthly high priest. He is a better high priest. Read about it in the book of Hebrews. He's the mediator of a new covenant too. He, as a, that song I sang said, he pleads for us. And by his intercession, he enables all his saints by grace to stand. That is, oh, that's such a powerful line that somebody wrote. He pleads for us. And by his intercession, he enables us by grace to stand. We have no business being in the presence of God if he didn't mediate for us first. It's all because he is there as our high priest. And it does set that pattern. When Jesus comes to set up his kingdom, he will return just as he left, literally, bodily, and visibly in the clouds. But he's prepared a place for us to be with him forever. I want to read a really interesting quote from a man named Toby Sumpner. He said, if Jesus merely rose from the dead and still walked among us to this day, salvation would not be complete. Salvation is not merely breaking out of the grave. Salvation is triumphing over sin and death and being reconciled to God, our father. Salvation is not merely coming to our senses and bursting out of the pig pen. Salvation is coming home to the father and being embraced and kissed and clothed in his finest robes and being given his ring and being seated in his presence as one of his children with fullness of joy. For if Jesus had to stay here without ascending to the Father, it would be for him to only be halfway done. Salvation is ascending to the mountain of God, going back into the Garden of Eden, being welcomed home and eating of the tree of life at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And so Jesus ascended. And one day we will ascend too, if we trust in him. One day we will ascend too. And then 10 days later comes Pentecost. Think about that. Again, I keep harping on this, but the, the brevity of time that has passed. For us, it's like thousands of years. It seems like this long drawn out process and the, the disciples seem to be sitting and praying for days and days and days. It was only 10 days they waited for the Holy Spirit. It occurred 50 days after the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it points to that great harvest of souls. And they saw a great harvest of souls, did they not? 
on that day of Pentecost, on that second chapter of Acts. We covered that here a number of weeks ago. But that was the day the gift of the Holy Spirit was bestowed upon both Jew and Gentile, and that we'd all be brought into the kingdom of God in that church age. Acts chapter 2 is the beginning of that story. And that story continues to today. That story continues. And you saw on that map, there was that gap, that summer harvest, the church age. 2,000 years plus. Who knows how many more? You know, we had to wait a long time for the first coming of the Lord Jesus. Who knows how long we'll wait for the second? Or who knows how short? We don't know. The church was actually established on that day of Pentecost when God poured his spirit out and 3,000 Jews responded to the sermon and received Christ. And that legacy lives on today. That legacy continues today. But it's not the end. There are three more feasts to go. We don't have time to go into detail on them, but I do want to touch on them. And these are the symbols of the three. The, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and um, the third is the most important, and the picture doesn't help me. So it is the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. It's symbolizing the future age of Jesus being with us. And so... Again, really quickly, those first four, that summer harvest, and then those three. In those three, we see some very interesting things about what's to come. Trumpets. When you, when you blow this shofar horn, it's only blown once a year at this Feast of Trumpets. It's a symbol of regathering of the people of God, gathering together of the people of God. Some think it symbolizes the rapture. Some people think that the rapture is going to happen on that day of trumpets, on that feast of trumpets. I don't know. We don't know the hour or the day. Jesus said that himself. It could mean that. Or it could mean the regathering of the children of Israel, the nation of Israel into a country again, a true country with the Levitical priesthood set up. Could mean either of those things. You can fight over that in the background. But the bottom line is there's going to be a regathering or a gathering of the people of God. Is that the church? Is that Israel? I tend to think it's Israel, but we can, we can find out really is what will happen. And there'll be this regathering. That's exciting because right now we're all spread out, but God is going to regather his people together. And then there's going to be this day of atonement. There's a prophecy uh, in the Old Testament that reminds us that the children of Israel, the Jewish nation will look on him whom they have pierced and repent. Right now, the nation of the Israel as a whole is not repentant of killing Jesus. Sure, individuals have believed, but as a whole, the nation is still stuck in this following of law. We see it all the time. In fact, take a drive today through Lakewood or through any of these towns over here, and you'll see the law being enacted during this Passover season. It's neat that they're being faithful, but they've missed their Messiah. But one day, on that day of atonement, that future day of atonement, they will look on him who they have pierced, and they will see him as their sacrificial lamb, and they will repent, and their sins will be forgiven. It's a beautiful thing. God doesn't let his people go. God will redeem his people. And then this last one, this day of tabernacles, this feast of tabernacles, you might see it. They set up these booths, these little like, wooden structures in their front lawn, and they live in them for a day or two or a week. They live in them for a period of time and uh, for the, during that feast time. And that tabernacle reminds us of what Jesus says in the book of Revelation, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will be with them and they shall be his people and almighty God shall dwell with them and he shall wipe away the tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying and no more pain for the former things have all passed away. And he said unto me, write these words for they are faithful and they are true. And it will be done. 
That Feast of Tabernacles points to that day when all will be made new, when the earth will be made new, the earth that groans and cries out for redemption, that is scarred because of the sin of mankind, will be renewed. When us and our feeble flesh and bone will find new bodies, and we will find a new king, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords who shall reign forever, and we shall reign with him on the earth, and we will be with him forever and ever and ever without end. The day is coming. These feasts are still to come. But again, just as sure as those feasts happened in the past, these feasts are coming. But I love this, this particular image, that church age, church age, that summer harvest. We don't know how long it will last, but it's a beautiful time. A time when the doors are swung wide open, the veil in the temple rent from top to bottom. Come into the presence of God. Come into the family of God. Come into the kingdom of God. Today is the day of salvation. And for you and me, I want to repeat what Peter said in Acts chapter 2 when this summer harvest began. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call is he calling you today I trust he has called you I trust that you have repented and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I love that he mentions baptism here. You know, you don't need to be baptized to be saved, but it's the first command of a Christian after uh, they are saved. And often we will have baptisms on Easter Sunday because it's a beautiful picture of what Jesus did, how he went down into death, into the waters of death and rose up again in the power of endless life. And in the same way, we do this baptism by immersion to symbolize we have died to this world. We have died to sin. We've died to self. And we are risen again in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is our Lord and Christ. If some of you have received Christ as your Savior and haven't yet obeyed the Lord in baptism, we welcome to talk to you about that. We'd love to baptize you because it's one of the best days of your life when you publicly declare, I belong to the Lord Jesus. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I am saved. I want to follow him into the harvest. And so today, we've got this beautiful picture that God has laid for us through his holy word. The climax of it all is Jesus risen from the dead. Here we are today. Let's celebrate the Savior. Let's celebrate his plan for all time. And let's look forward because Jesus is coming back as sure as his resurrection, he is returning. Are you ready? Are you ready for his return? Have you received Christ as your savior? And are you walking in the harvest? If you believe in him, are you walking? Will he find you ready for his return? It's coming. He is coming back. Maybe tomorrow, maybe today, maybe in three, four, five thousand 5,000 years. We don't know but he is coming. Are you ready? Jesus died. He was buried. He rose again. He's given us his spirit for those who believe, and he is coming again. That is the glory of Easter. That's why it's so many of our favorite day of the year, because it doesn't only just point to what God has done in the past, but it points to our blessed hope in the future, that he is alive forevermore. And he's coming again to receive us all to himself. And that harvest will one day be gathered together and we will be forever with the Lord. It's not a fairy tale. It's not really even a mystery. It's in plain language in the Bible. It's going to happen. Sure, we don't know exactly the details, but I like it that way. Because God, God gives good gifts, better gifts than we can ever imagine by reading them. And whatever we've imagined that eternity to be, it's going to be far better, and I can't wait. Are you ready? Heavenly Father, we have looked through long ages of the past where prophets foretold your coming, the coming of the Lord Jesus. 
from Passover to the unleavened bread, to the Feast of First Fruits, to Pentecost. All of these things were so perfectly laid out so that your people could not miss the Messiah. You know, to be a person in the audience as Peter shared and as Jesus himself shared the good news and of how every little jot and tittle of the Old Testament is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing. God, your plan is amazing. We worship you because your plan is so amazing. And we know it's only half the story because just as there's three more feasts, you made a promise and Jesus made a promise that he is coming back. And we await the day of the consummation of our hope when Jesus once again comes and touches down on that Mount of Olives and reigns forevermore. And we will be forever with the Lord. We await that day. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here that does not know you, that today would be their day. The day when they fall to their knees and say, Jesus is Lord. The day they repent of their sin and stand up in newness of life because they have applied the blood of Jesus Christ to their life. We pray that there would be salvation of souls today, this Easter Sunday. We ask your blessing on all these things and on the words that have been shared. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.